Robert Wallace has supported independent tech news directly for five years. Be like Robert. Become a DTNS member at patreon.com slash DTNS. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, June 24th, 2019 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Feline, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. We have got new Raspberry Pis. We have got new Samsung Smart Things. We have Google trying to help make the world better. Seriously, for real. All kinds of good stuff. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. The first public beta of macOS 10.15 Catalina is out now ahead of its expected July date. Catalina includes apps for music, podcasts, and TV to replace iTunes, as well as the Find My app and Sidecar for using an iPad as a monitor. Also, the public betas of iOS 13 and iPad OS 13 have been released early as well. Google's shutting down Hangouts On Air, which allows broadcasting a group video called Live over the internet. People who have been watching us live might be familiar with Google Hangouts On Air. Sometime later this year, this is supposed to happen. Now, Hangouts On Air is different from Google Hangouts, the app, which is also going away for G Suite users in October to be replaced by Hangouts Chat and Hangouts Meet. This is not at all confusing. Google's message about the impending shutdown of Hangouts on Air points people to youtube.com slash webcam, but that only works with a single video source and not group video chats. Uh, just a real quick side note. We used Hangouts on Air to stream the show up until June 1st. Uh, and then shortly after we stopped, they decided to get rid of it. I'm just saying, maybe it was us keeping it around. Uh, Meizu announced its 6.2 inch OLED Meizu 16S flagship phone with an in-display optical fingerprint scanner, 20 megapixel selfie camera in the top bezel, no notch, 48 megapixel Sony sensor in the photo and the camera on back, 7.6 millimeters thick, weighs 165 grams and runs Meizu's FlyMe OS built on top of Android on a Snapdragon 855 processor. It has a 3,600 milliamp hour battery and up to eight gigabytes of RAM and sells for around $500. Just, you know, no nonsense, solid $500 phone. All right, let's talk a little more about that new Raspberry Pi, Sarah. Yeah, uh, specs galore. The Raspberry Pi Foundation announced the Raspberry Pi 4 is now available with the faster system on a chip than previous models. The processor now uses the Cortex A72 architecture. It's quad-core 64-bit ARM version 8 at 1.5 gigahertz. The Pi 4's memory transfer speeds should improve after the foundation switched from LPDDR2 to LPDDR4 RAM. Gigabit Ethernet is replacing Ethernet over a USB 2.0. There are now two USB 3.0 ports, also two USB 2.0 ports, and USB-C port for the power brick. Bluetooth 5.0 now supported, and two micro HDMI ports replaced the full-size single HDMI port of versions past. That gets you support of two 4K monitors with H.265 decode for 4K 60p, H.264 for 1080p 60 decode, and 1080p 30 encode and OpenGL ES 3.0 graphics. The four pole headphone jack is pretty much the only thing that's remaining the same. The base model with one gigabyte of RAM costs $35. That's what it was before. And then you have two gigabytes of RAM model for $45 and the four gigabyte model for $55. Yeah, I, I for ports, I think it's a net positive. Getting a couple of Bluetooth uh, three or a couple of USB 3.0 ports is great, while preserving a couple of 2.0s for backwards compatibility. Backwards compatibility on all the pin ports that you use for Raspberry Pi stuff. Uh, the upgraded HDMI is good, although making them mini, I think, or, or micro HDMI may annoy a few people. So one minor negative there, uh, and then uh, replacing the the micro USB with uh, USB C. Uh, all seems pretty good. Roger, I know you're always attracted to these. Uh, you know, the the great thing about the Raspberry Pi has always been it gives you a full, fully functioning computer at an inexpensive cost, allowing it, you to use it for a lot of embedded or kind of DIY projects. Um, typically, before this, people would use like old laptops and, and similar machines. They were bulky and you could uh, they weren't necessarily what you would want if you, say, wanted to make like a, a controller or maybe something to, you know, build the DIY door cam or something like that. Um, I'm really excited. I, unfortunately, my child is still at the age where she'll probably just throw it at me instead of actually try <laughs> to figure out what it does. Uh, but definitely, the kind of in, in, in my sentiment, I feel like these are like the Legos for the 21st century. Yeah, in a way, they really are. And, and sometimes and, used and, with Legos. 
and very affordable. I mean, as you mentioned, you have to be a person who wants to tinker, whatever your age is, or have somebody help you to tinker. You know, buying a $35 one gigabyte uh, Raspberry Pi 4, you, you know, you just kind of got to look at it unless you know what to do with it, right? This is not a replacement for any computer that's an all-in-one solution, but but attractive pricing. Yeah, definitely. And and also, uh, you know, you, you have to bring the storage. Uh, it doesn't come with any storage on board. So there, there's some additional costs there. But 35 bucks, I, I think it was uh, FireDog 12 and Twitch said cheaper than Legos. in some, in uh, some Very case. much so, because for certain, I, don't, I know the reason why, but Lego has, Lego, the company has increased their prices slowly over the past eight years. Yeah. Could you use a Red Delicious Apple as a controller with your Raspberry? Yes, you can, because it conducts electricity. And so we were actually back at uh, Revision 3. Uh, Michael Hand, I'm sure uh, Sarah is familiar with Michael Hand, who was an intern, trying to come up with a way to use a banana and an apple as controllers uh, for a very simple program on screen display. Yeah. Uh, where you do you touch the apple you just and touch it and you conduct you, the electricity right yeah you basically it break red it. delicious good for something good yeah. for something till it rots we know uh yeah the, the, this is great for learning great for experimentation all that sort of thing uh samsung launched a new smart things cam for 89.99 not a bad uh price for for this sort of nest cam competitor type of thing uh it's not the cheapest one but it's not bad captures full hd video with hdr infrared for night vision two-way audio all the usual things can detect people has a 145 degree field of view 24 hours of free cloud storage backup for up to four cameras and samsung is offering 30-day backup so you get it 24 hours of backup for free 30-day backup for up to eight cameras for eight dollars a month or $80 per year. Samsung also announced a $18 SmartThings Wi-Fi smart plug, so cheaper than the Amazon one, actually, and a $10 SmartThings smart bulb. You do have to have a bridge for the bulb, but $10 for a smart bulb is pretty good. All three are available today for use with the SmartThings ecosystem. The cam and the smart plug can be used with or without the SmartThings hub. The smart bulb uses Zigbee 3.0, that's the one that needs the hub, and the devices work with Amazon, uh, Google Assistant, and Bixby voice assistant so you can control them with your voice uh good good prices especially for the bulb and the plug yeah this seems like the prices were specifically meant to be super competitive there, there are no specs here where people are like whoa i can't get that anywhere else but you've got you know ten dollars off here and there uh i i also know for anybody who's like mm, cloud storage don't want that you don't have to opt into that that's something that you can you can either choose to to have for free or not um, and of course, if you want more of the 30 day storage, you've got a subscription model, but yeah, track your prices. And Nest doesn't give me just, it just gives me stills. It doesn't give me video storage. Um, so it's, it's pretty common to have to pay for that stuff, but a lot of people don't want to, they just want to, they want to connect directly. There are other cameras for that, but if you're the kind of person who's fine with that cloud storage, cause you don't want to meddle with trying to open ports and get into your, your camera yourself, then the, these kinds of cloud storage offers are, are you know, are appealing. Uh, and Samsung, as far as trust goes, at least isn't as motivated to make money off your personal data as Google or Facebook or others would be. They just wanted to sell you the things, the objects, the hardware. And the service. And the service. <laughs> well, yeah, but they don't necessarily want to sell ads based on you, although I wouldn't put it past them if they could figure out how to monetize it. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, there's uh, something very compelling about uh, a lower price tag. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Well, and all these ecosystems, they know that if I were to get a smart things cam and, you know, maybe a couple bulbs and I get familiar with using the app and and I yeah, I have a a, a good or better experience with with Samsung's products in general, I'm just kind of going to stick with it because otherwise you're juggling a bunch of, of of smart ecosystems that sometimes don't work great in conjunction with each other. Yeah, Google Assistant and Amazon have made it easier to just use all this stuff together. I have LifeX and Philips and Techsy and all kinds of stuff in my house. Yeah. Um, and I just I just use the Amazon Echo to control that. But some folks may not realize that or just not want to risk it and have to deal with multiple systems. And so, yeah, once they get you in, it's easier to keep you. Google is expanding its Be Internet Awesome Children's Digital Safety Program to include media literacy. What does that mean? Well, new elements help children evaluate sources, identify credible information or 
information that is not credible. Fact check, avoid phishing attacks, learn what bots are and what they do, spot fake URLs and others. It was developed by Ann Collier, executive director from the Net Safety Collaborative, and Faith Rago, PhD and co-author of the Teacher's Guide to Media Literacy and co-founder of the National Association for Media Literacy Education. Children are taught that an expert in one topic not always an expert on everything. And, quote, if you can't find a variety of credible sources that agree with the source you are checking, you shouldn't believe that source. The new curriculum is available online for both teachers and families to use. Courses are offered in English, Spanish, and eight other languages. This was a breath of fresh air when I read this because it's detailed. This is meant for children and the lesson plans are designed for children. Uh, there are other media literacy uh, movements to, to help educate adults. But all of the stuff is the kind of thing we should be educating all of us on. Uh, an expert in, you know, physics isn't an expert in ecology. Uh, right. and, you know, the, and and you see things uh, cross post. Well, this is a scientist. Well, yeah, okay, but, but is she a scientist in this discipline that you're trying to claim? That's a big one you have to watch out for. And even to the to the subtlety of teaching children, hey, if you see one source that you usually think is credible and you can't find anybody else talking about this maybe don't believe it yet because maybe they got it mm -hmm. wrong. Uh, mm -hmm. This is good stuff. The, the kind of this stuff is also we something. Like, hey, yeah, exactly. In fact, we we there was there was a story last week where Tom was like, yeah, I don't know. Where's the second source? We found one eventually, but it's you you know you 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 learn to be wary of anything that 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 is not backed up by other credible sources. That over time you realize what those are and. I downloaded the PDF of the curriculum and, you know, scanned through it. It's quite long and quite um, involved. So it's not as if I've been able to teach a child this, but it also wasn't written like cutesy kindergarten speak. I think right. that this is something that's designed for people who, who might just kind of be new to this. Doesn't mean you have to be five years old. It just means you might, you might be an adult who's, who can get something out of this as well. I think that a, a, a variety of ages could benefit. Yeah, the real silver blade uh, in the Twitch chat says this should be in classrooms. That that's exactly what this is designed for. This is designed to be in classrooms, which is which is what's so good about it. And I like that Google isn't just doing it themselves. They're they're working with people who know this area and are experts in this actually experts in this area that they're trying to do. So that's that's good. And uh, like you said, these these tips go beyond not tips even just just a skill. The skill yeah. of of media literacy goes beyond uh what uh a child needs it's it's what a lot of us needs because we just didn't need to be as media literate as as we do now back in the mm -hmm. day there was a, a natural gate right you had three tv channels uh, a couple of daily papers and a, ra a few radio stations and the ones that didn't at least get it close to right didn't last that was easy nowadays you've got thousands of sources. And, and another thing they try to teach children is don't just believe something because it looks like it has a credible name. Anybody right. can come up with a name that sounds believable. I think well, uh, I, oh, ahead, I, I was going to add one of the really interesting bits was the little test where they give like it's like a multiple choice test, but you mark down which of these websites look credible and they'll have things like the Washington Post, but Washington is spelled incorrectly in the URL. Uh -huh. And so I thought that was actually brilliant because oftentimes it's not that people don't or are, are trust are very trusting uh, of sources that they've never seen before, but you know, to be sure that you're actually on the site that you believe that you're on. Yeah, the spotting fake URLs is part of this curriculum, right? It it just feels I I was very happy when I saw this because a lot of times I, I'll see something like this and I'll think, well, this is a little oversimplified. Well, they're kind of missing a few things. But this one doesn't seem to be that. This seems very well thought out and very well done. And so much more the kind of thing we need to do to get to the root of the problem. When I as I often do when we talk about fake news. Uh, knowing the effects of fake news are important in helping to combat the effects of fake news. And we don't know what the effects are. We haven't studied it very well. But being able to help people just avoid it, that's the best solution. Teaching children at a young age, this is what not to believe, will just make that fake news wither eventually. And understanding Once. that tactics will change in order to try to fool you. I mean, we, we all like to think of mm -hmm. ourselves as, you know, you never get one past, past me, but just over the weekend, Dropbox wanted me to change my password. And it was some phishing scheme that, you know, I, I was able to identify, but 
this is the sort of thing that you have to stay up on all the time. You don't yeah. just go like, oh, I understand it and it'll never be an issue. It will be an issue. And as long as you're educated and and understand what, what you know, what the curveballs to avoid, it's really helpful for all of us. I believe we'll live in a world one day where you won't have to be constantly vigilant about everything you read <laughs> and every email you get. Um, but we're not there yet. So no. we kind of do. IHS market analyst Jeff Lynn says Apple will release a 16 inch MacBook Pro in September. 16 inches. I didn't read that wrong. Uh, it will supposedly have a 3072 by 1920 LG display LCD panel, not an OLED, according to Jeff Lynn, and a new CPU. That makes sense. Ming Chi Kuo also said he hears Apple is making a 16 inch laptop. So uh, Sarah and Roger and I were racking our brains for a, a real reason that one might want a 16 inch laptop uh over say a 15.6 or or a 17. uh 17 just is gigantic i remember you had one of those sarah so Still maybe do. they're just yeah. trying to get bigger uh without getting too big i don't know yeah, you know, it's funny. My 17-inch MacBook Pro, which I still use kind of as a as a backup laptop, although it's very long in the tooth now, uh, originally I bought for video editing. And I ended up using it for kind of everyday stuff more than the editing. And it was big and unwieldy, and I don't miss that form factor at all. It's too big. But I also use an external monitor for most things, unless I'm traveling. So I can see where someone would say, no, 16 inch is great because it's still that larger screen for a lot of the, you know, maybe uh, content creation and creative stuff that I might need, but a little bit more compact than the 17 inch. But I also think, and is they, the 15 inch just too small then? They they probably got a pretty good deal or they got a deal on, on the monitor. Because when you make a, especially for, for laptops, and and other screens like TVs and, and monitors, um, they make the size based on how many sh how many pieces they can get out from a huge single piece of glass, the mother glass, and so that might be the 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 only size that was available for the resolution that they wanted. So if they wanted if they wanted something lower res, they could have gone with a bigger screen, but you would have it wouldn't have gotten that uh, that pixel density that they would have wanted, and that's just pure speculation on my part. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense, except Apple doesn't do things that way. They don't, like, get a good deal on laptops, screens, and then build a laptop around it. They pay extra for things because they think that's the right way to do it. Um, so my guess is it may be a little of both, right? It may be that they, they wanted to do 16 inches and then uh, and, and were debating maybe on the fence, I don't know, and and it worked out that they could they could get them easily. But again, I don't know. Even when I'm saying that, Apple doesn't care about whether it's cheap or easy. They never do. They just want to make it the way they want to make it. So they have a reason if they are going to do a 16-inch MacBook Pro, why they want to do it. And my guess is it'll be close to what Sarah was saying where, oh, you need a little more screen real estate, but you don't want it to be that huge. That's too big. And maybe poke fun at themselves for the 17-inch laptop or something. Well, it's not as if Apple is going to make the first 16-inch laptop either. So it you know, might have done enough market research to be like, yeah, it's a sweet spot for folks who are buying other manufacturer models. Oh, yeah. Beatmaster points out small bezel means they might say it's it's more screen real estate in the same size as this 15 inch macbook we used to make etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm -hmm. that's a pretty compelling apple type pitch i feel like well ihs markets jeff lynn he's been busy he also tells forbes that microsoft plans a foldable surface device for the first half of 2020 which may run android apps and Apple's iCloud service. The new Surface could have two nine-inch screens and a 4.3 aspect ratio and run the Windows Lite OS. That's sort of the going rumor at this time. The device reportedly will also have Intel's 10 nanometer Lakefield processor and have always-on connectivity by either LTE or 5G. Of course, no price as pricing or processing as of yet, but this sounds intriguing. Yeah, I, first of all, if they add iCloud support directly to Windows. I mean, you can certainly use iCloud uh, in, in lots of ways with Windows, but if they added it as a, as a service in Windows and Android apps, I would imagine they would be doing it for more than just this device. That seems like the kind of thing you might want to tout across a lot of devices. But I get what he's saying here is this is going to be that Windows Lite OS. And so it will be a Chromebook competitor. Uh, it will be foldable in that, it will be able to do more things like like a like a hybrid, uh, like a like a yoga type laptop, 
but it will mostly be, I think, targeted at Chrome OS saying, look, the advantage of Chrome OS is you can use all your Android apps. Well, guess what? You can on this too. Don't you think? I mean, yeah. unless it was priced uh, in some exponential way, I it, it sounds like it would it would be <laughs> extremely valuable. Yeah, uh, I I I think this is a uh, I think this is a believable rumor, and we we heard reports about them doing a foldable and what that might look like, and having the keyboard in, in one of the nine inch screens. And to me, pitching a laptop or tablet as a foldable. I think is an easier pitch than pitching a phone as a foldable. In fact, I look at the fold and the mate uh, both as as fold as unfoldable ta or foldable tablets rather than unfoldable phones. Uh, finally, Amazon unveiled an online beauty supply store for licensed professional stylists, barbers, and other estheticians. It sells supplies typically used in salons and spas from brands like Wella Color Charm and Rusk to OPI Professional. Buyers do need their state issued cosmetology or barber or esthetician license in order to purchase products. So this isn't meant for you or me. This is meant for your barber, for your stylist uh, to be able to get the supplies they need cheaper. Now, Ulta Beauty if and their chain are not going to use this because Ulta is a supplier, but it's already hurting Ulta stock because Amazon, when they move into anybody's business, uh, is usually seen as the kind of, of a harbinger of doom of a sort. Yeah, you know it's it's funny. I I I get uh, this fancy shampoo whenever I go and get my haircut. You know, once every six weeks or so, and it's it's products that they're there. They cost what they cost, and that's the way it works. Okay, well, if that salon can buy these products at a lower cost, will those savings be passed on to me? I don't know, but it's certainly advantageous to 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 the people at the salon who are buying those products. Yeah, exactly. I mean. Uh, uh, it will make it easier for your salon or your barber to pass the savings on to you. That's your individual shop will decide how much of that savings they can afford to pass on and what they mm -hmm. want in the competitive market. Remember, prices aren't dictated by supply. Prices are dictated by how much consumers will pay and what their competitive choices are, uh, not just supply. So if they can still charge you, they're still going to charge you, but uh, they might be able to give you more discounts. Uh, they might sell you the products for cheaper uh, to kind of keep you in the store and say, hey, you know, it's cheaper than you can get online. Imagine if they were buying from Amazon at such bulk rates with discounts that they could sell you in the shop for less than you would pay. And they'd show you on Amazon itself. Here's what you'd pay if you bought it from Amazon. But because I get it from Amazon, I can charge you less. I mean, that's not impossible, right? I actually pinged a friend of mine who's the founder and CEO of Style Seat, Melody McCloskey, who, if you're not familiar with Style Seat, is an on-demand service where you could book a hairstylist or a cosmetologist or a barber or an esthetician um, who might have some time in their week uh, without having to call the salon and see if that person is available. And she said, yeah, brands haven't been able to deliver wholesale or retail commerce at any scale, despite the size of the industry, which is huge. So she thinks the disruption will help the consumer and the professional. She also says her company plans to either work directly with Amazon or with wholesalers, wholesalers directly now that this is more of an option for them. I guess the downside of the story would be Amazon getting into yet another segment of the industry. Uh, and do are, are we getting to the point where Amazon is controlling too many pipelines if they do drive <laughs> a lot of other suppliers out, right? Yeah, I mean, we've been talking about that for some time, but yeah, right. but yeah, beauty industry, it, it, it is a big one. It's a big industry. It's beauty and is Amazon the beast? That's the question. Mm -hmm. And then is there a rose involved? I have no idea. Uh, <laughs> to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. Also, thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit. You can submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Hang out on Facebook. Join our group, facebook.com slash groups slash dailytechnewsshow. All right, let's check in with Chris Christensen, the amateur traveler, who's sharing a news item on United Airlines if you fly United regularly using AI to help passengers connecting flights. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler with another Tech in Travel Minute. One of the sharp-eyed members of the DTNS community, Reed, spotted a great article how United is using AI in its Connection Saver project to increase the chance that you're going to make your connecting flight. 
It's a complicated problem. Airline gets penalty if you take off late. Flight crews are on a clock in terms of how long they can work. If you're holding a gate, then that can slow down people coming in. Of course, if you leave late, that can make a problem for the people catching a flight at the other end. But the AI version of this program, when they match it head-to-head with human operators, has made 30% fewer missed connections. They're still rolling the program out to different airports, but if you make your next tight connection, you may have an AI to thank. I'm Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler. Well, promising. having had uh, misconnection problems with United that led to me not flying on them anymore, uh, I, I hope this works because <laughs> this is the kind of problem that AI can be really good at solving for sure. Yeah, I, I actually fly United. It's kind of my number one airline because I don't know, I'm a sucker, but uh, uh, misconnections, not a, a huge problem, but 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 having gate issues, uh, very much a regular problem. So it sounds yeah. like this could this could iron out a lot of issues. Missed connections belong on Craigslist. That's right. Here. Yeah. Keep them where they, they belong. Let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. Chad wrote in and, and mentioned the conversation we had last week. We were looking for somebody who had experience with upgrading legacy systems and enterprise settings. Chad says... I don't currently do this, thank the powers that be, but I spent seven years doing this for a medium-sized organization where my sole job was to take old, outdated legacy systems and get them up to date where possible and mitigate impacts where it wasn't possible. I could tell you tales of maintaining legacy VB6 code into 2017 to a five-year project that required us to rework the majority of our automation before we could even get the project completed. In many cases, it's not that companies don't want to modernize their technology stack. Unfortunately, it's not as simple as running an upgrade installer or pulling the old one out and putting the new one in. Often there are API changes, legacy code bases, outdated programming standards and languages, all of which has to be balanced with the what have you done for me lately mentality of the business that doesn't understand why the IT department is spending all their time on old stuff. Yeah, that's, you know what, I definitely want to do an interview uh, and and maybe it'll be with Chad. Uh, we got a couple of other emails from people who are are, are in the same predicament and have, have done these kinds of things. And it's important for us to try to understand why it is that a company is still running Windows XP. It may not be because they're dumb or don't get it or, or cheap. Uh, there, there's lots of other reasons like the ones Chad we're talking about here. So thank you, Chad. Thank you, Chad. And thank you to everybody who supports us on Patreon, patreon.com slash DTNS. Uh, if you're wondering, hey, what's that editor's desk thing you just mentioned? It's a weekly audio column that I do uh, for patrons at the $5 a month level and up, where I talk about how we think about the news we cover. Uh, so by all means, uh, if that sounds interesting to you, if you want a little more thoughtful uh, take, uh, this past week was about Libra. And why we covered it the way we covered it and how we covered it, uh, check it out, patreon.com slash DTNS. If you've got feedback for us, our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Email us early and often. If you'd like to join us live, we're live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Patrick Beja. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Dragon Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>